sad news this morning. Lou Reed died. He was reportedly in frail health for months. His fans reacting to the news and comparing notes on the impact one man had on all of modern music. On October 27th, 2013, Lou Reed died. Founder member of the seminal Velvet Underground, an iconic solo artist, Lou Reed transformed the face of music. He was very funny, brilliant, outrageous. He pushed all the boundaries. I believe in the power of punk. To this day, I want to blow it up. Lou Reed was one of the most important figures of rock and roll, who influenced lots of important people like David Bowie and Patti Smith and Talking Heads and Blondie. He walked on the wild side becoming a provocative spokesman for society's underdogs. He was ahead of his time. Lou Reed famously lived a life of outrageous excess, pushing everything beyond the limit. Oh yeah, I wanted him to take drugs, cause it's better than Monopoly. Most of the audience went hoping he would die on stage. The cause of Lou Reed's death was reported to be liver disease. Liver disease comes in many forms and has many potential causes. Lou epitomized the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle, yet remarkably lived to 71. So I'd like to know what ultimately claimed the life of this confrontational and enigmatic artist. World-renowned forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Hunter, has conducted thousands of autopsies. He's the chief medical examiner in one of America's biggest cities and investigates suspicious deaths. I've got access to biographical information and firsthand accounts that I'll use to examine how Lou Reed's liver disease developed and understand what drove Lou into his rock and roll lifestyle, seemingly with no regard for the consequences. March 6th, 2013, Paris, seven months before his death. Lou Reed is looking forward to embarking on his most extensive series of concert dates in recent years. As a warm-up for this upcoming tour, he has flown in to join his protege, Anthony Hegarty, on stage to perform for one night only. Lou gets up on stage and sings Candy Says, one of his best songs. It's a very beautiful song. Anthony Hegarty's almost on the point of tears. It's a very moving performance. But to those who know Lou, it's clear he's not himself. My mouth just dropped. I mean, he was so sick and so not Lou, but trying so hard. It ripped me up, I'll tell you. It is the last time he sings in public. Looking at this footage of Lou in his last performance, I can see he looks gaunt. Weight loss is a common symptom in someone with serious liver disease so it's not surprising people thought he looked ill. However, the fact he is embarking on a tour tells me he's perhaps doing better than appearances suggest. And I can also see for the last 25 years of his life, Lu practiced Tai Chi, a Chinese martial art based around slow meditative movements for two hours a day, which may have bolstered his immune system. Despite Lu's optimism for the future, he will be dead by the end of the year. Lewis Allen Reed was born in Brooklyn on March 2nd, 1942. At the age of nine, Lou's family moved to suburban Freeport, Long Island. His father, Sidney Reed, was an accountant, while his mother, Toby, was a former beauty queen. His mother and father were very typical suburban parents of the time. I would say that Lou Reed and I had a fairly normal childhood growing up. But things began to change when Lou got to high school. 
he started becoming a little on the rebellious side. By the time we were seniors in high school, he was very rebellious. Lou began to immerse himself in music and poetry and teaching himself to play the guitar. By the age of 14, he had made his first record with local doo-wop group, The Jades. At that time, he was writing a lot of poetry. It blew me away. It was very gay-oriented. And he was a guy that had a girlfriend most of the time, and I didn't understand it. I said, why all this gay reference? He said, I'm just very interested in it. Throughout his teens, Lou was increasingly drawn to New York's nightlife, commuting to the city to play gigs, see bands, getting acquainted with Manhattan's underbelly. He experimented with drugs early on, which was very, very unusual in Long Island in the mid-1950s. In 1964, he met John Cale at a party. They went on to form one of the most influential rock and roll bands of all time, the Velvet Underground. Under the management of Andy Warhol, they epitomized the drug-fueled creative explosion of the 1960s. They were pushing to show how different they were and to shock people. Lou's fascination with subculture and people rejected by society inspired his work, most famously in his 1972 album Transformer and the hit Walk on the Wild Side. Lou Reed was 71 years old when he died, but there are many reasons for a man of his age to succumb to illness. He was not a typical 71-year-old. I can see in these biographical reports that throughout his life, Lou had seriously abused his body. However, I've discovered a significant event in his teens which may explain what drove him to such famous excesses. Fall. 1959, Long Island. Shortly before Thanksgiving, Alan Hyman received a disturbing call from his old school friend. Lou Reed called me and he said, I'm in a very bad way. I'm getting some treatments for depression. For a number of years, Lou had been suffering from anxiety and panic attacks. Then, at the age of 17, Shortly after leaving home for college, Lou Reed had a nervous breakdown. He was having major mood swings. His parents sent him to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist recommended that he have treatments. It turned out that he was having electroshock therapy. Lie here, please. Electroconvulsive therapy is a procedure where small electrical currents are sent through the brain, causing seizure-like activity. It changes the pattern of blood flow and metabolism of areas of the brain which may be affected by depression. The electrical shock seems to reset serotonin levels, the neurotransmitter involved in mood and arousal. Although there is no clear understanding on exactly why it works, there's plenty of evidence that ECD can be particularly effective for easing severe depression and, in some cases, reducing psychotic episodes. Nowadays, ECT is administered under sedation, and there are strict guidelines about giving the treatment to minors while the brain is still developing. But back in the 50s, not only was it a very brutal treatment, sometimes it was used irresponsibly. Open your mouth. His parents did what the doctor told him to do. They just did what they thought was best and right. Lewis was strapped down and shocked. Three, two, one. This is a young man. So to have this traumatizing, somewhat painful, confusing procedure would have been really difficult and to some extent affected his, his trust in his relationship with his parents, would have affected his, his trust in sort of authority. Lou, in later life, said that his father sent him for ECT because his father was concerned he had homosexual feelings. Three, two, 
one. It's always important to understand behavior in the context of time. During his childhood, homosexuality was deemed a psychiatric condition. Our sexuality is key to our identity. It's, it's kind of one of the most honest things about us. The idea that what you find attractive and how you see yourselves is sick, that would have been so difficult for a young person to deal with. Lou's sexuality was to be ambiguous throughout his life. But whatever the reason behind the decision to subject him to the treatment, the fallout from ECT was far-reaching. The boundaries are kind of gone, and I believe that probably the ECT blew them away. I, honest, I honestly, I mean, when you think about what it's doing. He always said that it blocked out part of his mind, and he couldn't think the way he wanted to think. And he was so angry that he was forced into that, that it was part of his need to be different, to not be Lewis Reed from Freeport, but to be Lou Reed, the whatever he became. I could see that the impact of Lou's experiences in the psychiatric center was far reaching and devastating. So I need to investigate the ways it steered the course of his life if I'm going to discover the cause of his death. March 2013, Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, seven months before his death. Lou and his wife, Lori, are meeting with Dr. Charles Miller for the results of some tests on Lou's liver. I've got your results here. It's not good news, Lou. Lou faces unassailable medical evidence that he is very seriously ill. I can see from reports that Lou had been receiving treatment for a form of liver disease for many years, but this obviously hadn't worked. The liver is the largest internal organ involved in detoxifying almost everything that enters the body. There are over a hundred different types of liver disease, and some are genetic. Crucially, this is most often a lifestyle illness caused by a variety of factors which damage the liver. Over time, this damage causes irreversible scarring, which is also known as cirrhosis. There are no indications here that this was hereditary. So to discover what killed Lou Reed, I need to look back into his earlier life to find where this damage may have started. In the late 1960s, Lou performed with his band, The Velvet Underground, at the very cool Max's Kansas City. Lou and John Cale named the band after a book about wife swapping and kinky sex in American suburbia. I think one inseparably associates The Velvet Underground with transgression, deviant underworlds, very dark inner impulses that could be expressed through music. The Velvet Underground was managed by the artist Andy Warhol, and Max's Kansas City was his favorite club. Max's Kansas City was dark and smoky. People drank a lot, and cocaine was available all over, and God knows what they were doing in the bathroom. All these wonderful eccentrics, speed freaks, transsexuals, and all these great celebrities of the Warhol world would sit around a round table in the back room at Max's, and they would take their clothes off and have sex and take drugs. The whole thing was a completely over-the-top atmosphere, in which I think Lou thrived. Their songs, Heroin and Waiting for the Man, had encouraged the Velvet Underground's growing reputation as a drug band. Despite having written heroin, and he did use heroin at college, first of all, I think heroin played a relatively small part in his life. He was an amphetamine user. That was his thing. He told a friend of his, I'm going to take speed every day for the rest of my life. 
and for much of his life he did. Amphetamines, also known as speed, are a group of powerful synthetic psychostimulants. They work by increasing neurotransmitter activity in the brain, stimulating the central nervous system, raising the levels of norepinephrine and dopamine, chemicals which can cause a feeling of euphoria, making users more alert, and increasing their concentration. In the 1960s, the negative effects of amphetamines were not widely understood, and there are many reports of people using them to boost their creative and professional abilities. The whole culture was about speed. Working through the night, working, 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 writing, writing, going at 100 miles an hour. Andy Warhol tells a story about how they would argue about which forms of speed were better than others. At this time, many artists were doing this, and it was seen as sort of, you know, pulling an all-nighter and drinking lots of coffee. You know, this was seen as sort of a sign of a good work ethic. This was, would have fed in very much to his narrative of, I'm an artist, I'm not afraid to expand my mind, to look at where this is going to take me, to push the boundaries. And that's, I think, why we, we see the drug addiction emerging. Amphetamines are highly addictive and toxic to the brain, so over time there are many negative side effects. We know that during this period, Lou used this drug in large quantities to keep himself going, overriding his body's biochemistry. Then, he would use other drugs to bring himself down. Lou had enough sense that he would always have a little stash of some kind of downer to take the edge off when the time came. Typically, people using stimulants recreationally would use minor tranquilizers like benzodiazepines to bring themselves down. But I can see that there are accounts that Lou sometimes took a highly unusual drug to counter the effects of amphetamines, Thorazine. Medically, it's used to treat major states of mental disturbance in schizophrenics and other psychotic patients. It works by blocking receptors in the brain, preventing the overactivity of dopamine, the neurotransmitter responsible for regulating mood and behavior. If there was nothing else around, Lou would take whatever was there, and he'd take Thorazine. But it made your brain like clay. I've discovered that Lou was first prescribed the drug following his ECT treatment in 1959. Lou had Thorazine because his mind wasn't like it was supposed to be, that he had crazy thoughts. But he also loved having those crazy thoughts because it made him creative. Lou talked about using Thorazine as a badge of honor um, because it was the strongest of the antipsychotic drugs. The combined effect of this cocktail of uppers and downers would have caused a buildup of toxicity in Lou's liver, leaving him susceptible to any number of potential causes of long-term illness or death. But as it does not cause scarring of the liver, I'm discounting it as a primary cause of Lou's death. However, Dr. Hunter has found evidence of another addiction, which can have a catastrophic effect on the liver. March 2013, Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, seven months before his death. Lou meets with his doctor. The news is not good. The liver disease has not responded to treatment. The damage to his liver has developed a deadly complication of cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, cancer. Liver cells damaged by cirrhosis need to be rapidly replaced by the body. It's thought that over time, this leads to mutations in the patient's DNA, which allow cancer cells to grow uncontrollably. At this stage, Lou's only chance is a new liver. I'll call you when I know more. Time is running out for Lou, who has been putting his health at risk for decades. And there's something else Lou's doctors are concerned about. Fall. 1970. Frustrated by the Velvet Underground's lack of commercial success, 
Lou quits the band, triggering a second nervous breakdown. He returns to live with his parents, taking a job in his father's office. He was furious, upset, and hurt that the Velvet Underground did not make the kind of waves it should have, and it broke his heart. Reports suggest Lou stopped using amphetamines during this period, giving his liver the chance to recover from any damage he may have done. But I can see that Lou began to rely on another substance that had the potential to cause the kind of damage cirrhosis that can lead to cancer, alcohol. The reason why Lewis drank was because it calmed him down so that he could handle what was going on. Hey, honey. But Lou's then girlfriend, Betty, became increasingly concerned about his drinking. He could drink six, seven, eight scotches and you're not actually gonna see any real changes. And it wouldn't be until, what, 10, 11, I mean, half a bottle, I don't know what, you know, that he would start slurring. He was very, very good at hiding the effects of scotch. We know that people that experience trauma in childhood are much more likely to experience addiction later on. What Lou went through at 17 could, could certainly be described as traumatic. He, he was very fearful of it, he lost control. So certainly, I think the addiction that we see later on in life, it comes at least partly from this dark place. This lifestyle would have been playing havoc with his mood, especially if he had a mental illness or a personality disorder. From 1970s onwards, Lou was drinking, yes, a bottle of scotch a day. If Lou Reed was drinking this quantity of alcohol, he was consuming much more than what we now consider safe. Excessive alcohol in the blood on a regular basis kills off cells in the liver, which leads to scarring or cirrhosis, sometimes resulting in cancer. Having drunk to dangerous levels during the 1970s, in the early 80s, Lou turned to Alcoholics Anonymous for help with his addiction and appeared to clean up his act. He gave the impression that he was sober throughout the rest of his life, but members of his band, up to the year before he died, when he stopped touring, they said that when he was on the road, he would like to go out for dinner after the show, and he invariably drank white wine. Lou continued to drink. That sort of irrepressible alcoholism which he had would lead, of course, to secret drinking. March 19th, 2013. City Winery, Manhattan, seven months before his death. While waiting for a suitable donor to be found, Lou turns up unannounced and performs a reading. There's no way I could be more unprepared. Despite his liver cancer, there are concerns that he's been drinking. He was a creative person. If he feels that he can't be that without these drugs or alcohol, then that extension of life for another five or 10 years or whatever he hoped for will be meaningless. We don't know whether Lou was still drinking during his liver cancer. His speech at this point could appear slurred as a result of hepatic encephalopathy, a decline in its brain function that occurs as a result of a severely diseased liver. Crucially, the transplant is unlikely to go ahead if alcohol is in his system. Since Lou doesn't know when a donor liver may become available, it would be reasonable to assume that he is alcohol-free during this period. Following his appearance at the winery, Lou cancels his upcoming tour, citing unavoidable complications and disappears from public life. April 2013. Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, six months before his death. Lou is waiting at the Cleveland Clinic for a donor liver to become available. He's becoming impatient and tells the doctor he wants to forget about it and go home. But a liver has been found and is on its way to the hospital. 
When can you do it? When can you do it? Before the operation goes ahead, a cross-match test is performed. And that's where the donor and recipient cells are mixed together to see if the donor cells are attacked. If the test is positive, rejection is around 20% more likely. We don't know the results of that test, but it's decided that the operation will go ahead. Rock star poet Lou Reed died on October 27, 2013, following a long battle with liver disease. Eminent medical examiner Dr. Michael Hunter is investigating the compelling events of Lou's life to determine what ultimately caused the death of this prodigious artist. After decades of abusing his body with drugs and alcohol, Lou Reed is undergoing a liver transplant. April 2013, Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, six months before Lou Reed's death. Against the odds, he survives the operation. Surviving surgery of this magnitude shows that Lou must have been in better shape than he appeared at the time. This is a great sign. And now that this first hurdle is over, we know that statistically, he has an 86% chance of surviving at least another year. June 6, 2013, Manhattan. Less than five months before his death, and only six weeks after his major surgery, Lou is seen up and about walking in New York. There is this period when he's had the transplant where Lou is full of energy. Good How are you you. feeling, Mr. Reed? Good. And he was saying, worse the effect, I'm a triumph of medicine, I'm, gonna, I'm back, I'm bigger and better than ever. But on June 30th, 2013, at 7 a.m., Lou is rushed to Southampton Hospital, Long Island, suffering from severe dehydration following a vomiting fit. He will remain there for three days. Vomiting is often a sign of organ rejection, which occurs in around a third of cases. The immune system's natural response to the new and foreign liver is to attack it. Since the operation, Lou would have been taking powerful immunosuppressant medication to stop this happening. It works by suppressing the immune system, allowing his body to accept the new liver. Lou's hospitalization at this point may mean that the delicate balance of this critical medicine needs fine tuning. His doctors will be working fast. Too much, and they run the risk of leaving Lou vulnerable to the dangers of infection. Too little, and his liver will fail. September 3rd, 2013. Royal Opera House, London. Eight weeks before his death. Lou is well enough to fly in to accept the prestigious Inspiration Award at the GQ Men of the Year ceremony. It seems his recovery is back on track, and he's in fighting spirit. There's only one great occupation that can change the world. That's real rock and roll. I believe to the bottom of my heart, the last cell that rock and roll can change everything. And I believe in the power of punk. To this day, I want to blow it up. Thank you. Lou was always a master of disguise, so that even terminally ill, he would be very concerned that his public wouldn't directly recognize that. October 3rd, 2013. John Varvedo's store, New York. 24 days before his death. Lou attends a launch celebrating a book collaboration with his old friend, renowned photographer, Mick Rock. But this time, the audience is in for a shock. He looked terrible, he was yellow, he was feeble. This photograph shows Lou's eyes are yellow, 
his skin is yellow, that can mean only one thing in the situation. The transplanted liver is failing. One of the liver's functions is to clear toxins from the blood. If the liver is failing, a yellow colored substance called bilirubin builds up in the skin. Lou is running out of options. Monday, October 20th, 2013. Cleveland Clinic, Ohio. One week before he dies. Lou meets with his doctor. But there is bad news. There really is nothing more we can do for you. Lou's liver specialist says they have run out of treatment options. Accompanied by his wife, Lori, Lou returns home. Saturday, October 26th, Long Island, 12 hours before his death. Lou is in a lot of pain and has to lie on the floor to get comfortable. He and Lori stay up all night talking. Sunday, October 27th, Long Island. Lou and Lori are enjoying the morning sun. She recounts how Lou attempts to relieve his pain with some soothing Tai Chi moves. She vividly and poetically describes how she held him and he was doing his Tai Chi hand movement and he dies. Lou Reed died this weekend. He had survived a liver transplant that extended his life, but the end came at home on Long Island after his doctors determined there was nothing more they could do. My daughter uh, called and said, Mom, I don't want you to hear this, but it's all over the news. Lou died. He was 71. He was too young. It, it, it was just impossible that he would go. I think I heard about it the way everybody else did. You know, it was in the news. He was the most difficult person. And I was willing to put up with all of his bullshit, you know, because I loved him. He was, he was my friend. When I heard it was, oh, shit, I was sad because you're losing somebody that you were close to who I really connected with. You know, I mean, we had a good time. We really did. The news releases relating to Lou's cause of death are extremely vague. There was every reason to be optimistic that the operation would be successful, so I need to understand what else was going on in Lou's body to get to the root of his death. I've discovered that in the hours and days following the news, rumors began to fly that Lou Reed had died of AIDS. Put it bluntly, and pardon the question, are you a transvestite or a homosexual? Sometimes. Which one? I don't know. What's the difference? There's been certainly rumored over the years that Lou could well have been HIV, either from needles or from sexual contacts. AIDS is the final stage of HIV, an infection that attacks the immune system. Chronic liver disease and cancer are common among HIV patients. For a large period of his life, Lou abused drugs through intravenous injection. But there's something else in his past that could potentially have put him at risk. For a number of years, there had been rumors about Lou's sexuality. After his marriage to Betty ended, his next significant relationship was with a transvestite called Rachel, Rachel was his live-in boyfriend for a long time. Lou always referred to Rachel as a girl, although he wasn't trans. He was, he was definitely a boy. But Lou was nuts about Rachel. After four years together, the relationship fell apart, and Rachel disappeared. 
Rachel, as we know it, and as I've heard of it, died from AIDS in the early 90s. I have discovered that Lou was taking a drug called interferon as far back as the late 80s. This is a drug that was developed around that time to combat a range of illnesses, but rose to prominence as a treatment for HIV AIDS. However, I don't see any evidence that Lou was fighting multiple infections typical of AIDS, and there's no indication on his death certificate that points to specific complications caused by the disease. So I can safely discount this as contributing to the cause of death. However, interferon's ability to boost the immune response is typically exploited to fight another disease associated with lifestyle, hepatitis C. 1964, New York. Lou is embracing life at the heart of the city's drug and music scene. Back in the 60s, there were a bunch of us that got hepatitis. None of us knew we had hepatitis until they discovered hepatitis C. I mean, it wasn't even a disease. What have you been taking? <laughs> I can see that as far back as the early 1960s, Lou Reed was treated for hepatitis, an infection of the liver. The hepatitis C strain wasn't identified until 1989. The only way it is transmitted is through blood, and this happens commonly from the sharing of hypodermic needles with someone who's already infected. The first reference to hepatitis very clearly is when he's in his last year at college. And Lou himself said that he used a dirty needle to shoot up, and he got hepatitis. People didn't talk about sharing needles back then. Sharing needles was something that people did and didn't know that you were gonna get hepatitis from it. Back in the 1960s, hepatitis was thought to be relatively harmless. So Lou would have had no idea of the long-term impact this would have on his health. His symptoms of tiredness, joint pain, and stomach pain at that time would have probably been treated with corticosteroids and bed rest. What we know now is that over time, hepatitis C destroys liver tissue, causing scarring and creating the right conditions for cancer. Although Lou's drug use would not have directly caused the damage, it may have accelerated it. Hepatitis is a cause of 80% of liver cancers worldwide and is also potentially fatal in its own right. With interferon, the cure rate for hepatitis C was only about 30%. I see that he was treated at least twice for the disease, but Lou couldn't shake it off. Cirrhosis caused by the combination of alcohol abuse and hepatitis C did not respond to interferon, and the damage to his liver became cancerous. That's what led Lou to seek a liver transplant. I can now reveal what was going on in Lou's body as it struggled to deal with his failing transplanted liver. The fact his skin and eyes became yellow means his liver is being rejected or reinfected, possibly both. He could be under attack on two fronts. His immune system is rejecting the alien organ, and the immunosuppressant meds could have allowed the hepatitis C virus to emerge from hiding and also attack his new liver. He is in a no-win situation. But there's something else. Lou was told that there was nothing more doctors could do about a week before he died. Now, this is significant. If rejection and hepatitis C were the only problems, doctors would have options to consider. To me, this suggests a secondary cancer has been detected. The cancer in his original liver must have metastasized and spread to other parts of his body before the organ was removed. If that was the case, once cancer was detected, doctors would likely advise stopping treatment for the liver failure. This appears to be just what happened. Liver failure is usually a painless way to die. So the report that he was in a lot of pain 
the night before he died, also points to metastatic cancer, perhaps in his bones. In the final hours, Lou's breathing is affected as his heart struggles to work efficiently. His body becomes weaker as the liver begins to fail. His brain function slows. Eventually, his heart stops, cardiac arrest, and death. Lou grew up in an era where his mental health was not fully understood, and this set him on a path of self-destruction during the years where the effects of drugs were not yet known. He was a real product of his time, yet despite his adversities, he transformed the face of music. There's a lot of stories around here, if you just look. But not everything happens to me on my albums. I get a lot of ideas just sitting around parking lots. He challenged me to look at the world that I lived in in a way that was different. He was kind of ahead of his time. He was very funny, brilliant, outrageous. He pushed all the boundaries, and that was the man that I fell in love with. It's amazing he lived to 71, considering what he did to himself. He could not have been Lou Reed if he hadn't done heroin and done speed and hung around down and out junkies in the street. He was always going to be on the edge, and that's where he wanted to be, because that's who he was.